just so that everyone's aware. Um, so yeah, I think I think at this point everyone's pretty comfortable with Zoom and and using the platform. So I'm not going to go through it again. But if anyone has any issues, please uh, please just speak up in the next minute, or uh, you can you can contact me through the chat at the bottom there, um, and I will get you sorted if you if you have any issues at all. Um, yeah, uh, so first we'll hear from uh, from Warren from Evergreen and Gold Renewables. Um, they're, uh, they're a local uh, solar company and, and he can he can fill you in on some other stuff that they do. I believe they, they do some work around energy efficiency as well um, and as well as a few other things. Um, and then uh, and then after that, Justin Smalley from Inglewood Community is going to talk about uh, about their experience uh, getting a solar array put up that um, that they had installed last fall, I believe, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then and then at the end, I'll just provide some some other resources for everyone and, and maybe run through a couple things if I think that there's anything important that's been missed. Um, yeah, so I think um, yeah, if you oh so so how we'll run it is um, if the the way that we'll run questions, I think just for the for the ease of the presenters is if you have any questions throughout the presentations, just you can you can open up the chat through the bottom of your screen and you can just ask them in there. And then at the end of the presentation, I will read off all the questions in order, and uh, and our presenters will get to them. Um, and then if we don't have time to get to your question, which I think we probably will tonight, but uh, if that does happen, you can just uh, email me back at the email that I sent out from the email I sent out earlier today or at um, greenleagues at efcl.org. And I will do my best to get back to you. Um, yeah, and then, and then also the, the recording I will, I will make available for everyone. Um, I'm gonna post them all to the website after this one, so I'll have all three of the recordings from the from the workshops, and they'll all go up, and I'll send emails to everyone who's been a part of the who's who's attended any of the workshops with with the link for that, um, as well as any um, PowerPoint uh, notes that the presenters are willing to share. So yeah, um, without uh, further ado, Warren, uh, Warren, if you wanna go ahead and introduce yourself and and get started. Hello, everybody. Sorry about that. I have I have two monitors on my computer, so if I'm not looking at this, it's because I'm looking at the other monitor. And uh, <clears throat> so, welcome everybody. Hopefully, uh, I'll be able to give you some basic information on solar and answer any of the questions you guys have. And as Mike had mentioned, just please uh, drop us a chat, and uh, I'll be more than happy to answer some of the questions for you. Uh, I've got a little short presentation, it's probably about 20 minutes. And um, and I think I'll just get into it right now and then as the questions come, we'll just see what we can do, okay? I'm gonna share the screen. Nope, oh, I think you have to enable that for me, Mike. Sorry, Warren, did you request? Because I don't have anything popping up, but Normally it comes up. So it says that the host has disabled the attendee screen sharing. Oh, of course. Well, let's see if I can figure this out. <clears throat> uh, uh, participants. This must be a new setting that they've added that I can't, um, <laughs> it's not default. Allow record, rename, put away or make post. Okay, um, great. Uh, ah, there we go. You should be okay now. Okay, thank you. Yep, that seems to be working. Okay. Yeah. Oh, yeah, there we go. So, everyone can see that? Yep. Okay, going to play mode. Okay. So as Mike had mentioned, I'm a, a local solar business. I'm the owner of a local so solar business. Been around since uh, 2010. Uh, for about six years, I was on the board of 
what was then called the Solar Energy Society of Alberta. It's called Solar Alberta now. And it's a nonprofit. It's been around about 45 years now. And uh, its task was to uh, provide education to the general public. And I think it's still doing quite a good job of that. And at the time in 2012-13, the EFCL came to us and asked us to help them develop a program for um, energy efficiency up grades on the community league buildings as well as uh, some demonstration solar uh, pilots so we did that i um, worked with community leagues ever since i've been involved with the green leagues program since its uh, development as well and uh, along the way we've installed eight systems on um, community leagues and fairly soon here we're going to be putting a system on the Parkdale Cromdale Community League, which is just downtown, very close to Commonwealth Stadium. Happens to be my league, so I'm particularly happy about that. And uh, we're just really waiting for the funding to come through from the city so they can get the roof done first. Um, just to complete, since this is uh, 101, I'm gonna get some fairly basic stuff out of the way. And so you're gonna hear terms power and energy quite uh, often. And one of the challenges that we have is that when you buy the systems, it's quote, the size of it is quoted in, in watts, which is the power of the system. But what happens at, at the end of the day is it generates energy. And that's then calculated in kilowatt hours, which is what shows up in your electricity bill. And so that is based on the amount of time that it's, it's producing um, power for, okay? So that's the difference between power and energy. And how those things interrelate is here's a um, example of a system that's on Queen Alexandra Community League actually. This is the day in October, which is not normally seen as a particularly great time of year to produce uh, solar, but in this case, it was very good. So they had a, bought a eight kilowatt system. And so this day they're producing a peak of six kilowatts, which is what you see at basically at noon. And if you look in the upper left-hand corner here where my mouse is, you'll see another number, which is almost 39 kilowatt hours. And that's actually this accumulated energy that's underneath this graph here, okay? And so even though it's only peaking at six kilowatts, it manages to produce in the course of a day in the fall, 39 kilowatt hours. And so over the course of the year, that would accumulate to something fairly significant. In terms of how we compare, uh, here's a little graphic between us and Germany. The colors on this on the map um, are related to how much potential it has to generate electricity. The um, closer you are to red, the more you can produce. So in Germany's case, um, it's kind of a teal green. And if you look on the map of Canada, that's kind of like Prince Rupert. Anybody knows what Prince Rupert's like? It's like today here, but every day of the year. They rarely get much sunshine, okay? And, but in Germany, there's a lot of solar photovoltaics. Um, and if we look at the number up here, 1250 here and 850 in Germany. So basically we can produce about 50% more electricity from the same amount of solar that's installed. So if we took the same system installed in Germany, Install the same system here in Edmonton. And in the case of Hamburg, it happens to be at the same latitude as us, so they're just as far north as we are. We would produce almost 50% more electricity. So it's a very good area for electricity because we get a lot of sunshine and we don't have a lot of cloud cover, but also for this, because we have cooler temperatures. And that's not just the wintertime, but also in the summertime. The fact that our average summer temperatures are like, 25, 30 degrees Celsius, that's very good for solar. Cooler temperatures makes more electricity. So all that adds up to being Edmonton being a very good place for solar. The times of the year that we don't think we can produce much electricity in the winter time, it's generally between say the middle of November to the middle of February. And on the, over the course of a year, that's only about 10% of our annual potential for generating electricity. So the fact that it snows here, but it snows during those times of the year when it's really only gonna produce maybe 10% of our annual amounts anyways, 
it doesn't have as much impact as a lot of people think. So we have cool temperatures, it does snow, but the snow doesn't make as much of an impact as you think it would. Since about 2008, there's a regulation in Alberta, it's called the microgeneration regulation, and it basically allows a building owner, homeowner, community league to put solar on the roof of their building, generate electricity, but it's limited. You can generate over the course of the year as much as you consume over the course of the year. And so it's intended to offset your own building's consumption. Okay. So the challenge with that, if you have a large building and not much consumption, you can't cover the whole roof of solar. Okay. So that is a limitation. Okay. It's generally not a problem. It's usually the opposite problem we have. We, we tend to consume a little bit more energy than we can generate over the course of the year. Although that totally depends on the building. Okay. The regulation only applies for renewable energy. So you can't just run out and buy yourself a natural gas fire generator or something like that. It doesn't work for that. <clears throat> so this is specifically designed for renewable energies. Could be wind, could be solar, could be biomass, but honestly, in the cities, it's solar. Okay, that's really the option you have. Okay. Um, there's no batteries. The system is connected to the grid. And what happens, I'll show you a little bit later. On those days where it's sunnier and you're generating a lot of electricity, more than what you're using at that time, your excess is actually, instead of being stored in a battery, it's sold back to the grid. And then basically it goes to your neighbor. Okay. It goes to whoever is closest to your building that's using electricity. Okay. But that's great for community leagues because then community leagues are basically community generators. Okay. Now here's a graphic at the top. This is one day and this is typically what happens. Okay. So this is from midnight to midnight at night when the sun's down, all this red is your consumption that you're buying from the grid. Okay. When the sun comes up in the morning, you get this little green line started. The line itself is the amount of solar and the shade is the amount of energy that you're producing. So what happens is the red line here is your consumption. It continues on pretty much at the same level. So the white area underneath here, this is the part of your generation that you are consuming. So basically you're getting that for free from the grid. Okay. Um, if anybody's looked at the stuff that Justin posted earlier, he tried to explain this, that this is the best value for your solar. Because when you look at your energy bill, your delivery charges are generally higher than your energy charges. And so this is the big benefit of solar. If you can push your consumption into the daytime when you're generating, basically anything in this area that's white, you're not paying delivery charges for. Okay. The excess above this, the green shaded stuff, you sell that back to the grid and you get paid for that. Okay. And so the only thing you're buying that's on this graph here are the pink bits. Okay. So once the sun goes down is the pink bits. So if you were to drop your consumption at night and increase it during the day, you would actually get a better value from your system. Okay. In terms of what you can do, this is community league that's very close to the EFCL's administration building. This is the Queen Alexandra Community League. And this system that we show here in this picture actually provides 100% of their electricity. And so they're for the course of a year. And so as you notice, there's a lot of brown shingle space left on the roof here. Okay. So they actually could not fill their whole roof with a solar system. Okay. Now they happen to have an energy meter as well on this. And that's what this graph is from in the above here. And so this allows them to monitor all the energy consumption in the building as well as their generation. And so they can actually do these calculations. Okay. This is also a nice tool. I'll show them a bit more detail later on. It's also a nice tool if you're trying to do grant applications for other efficiency upgrades. And I can show you some examples from Evansdale as well, if anyone's interested. And they use this information to actually request grants. So they, they basically got, they did the solar, they put in an energy monitor, and then they did some analysis and they went in and they asked for some grants to do energy efficiency upgrades and it reduced 
the amount of their consumption. So now they've actually managed to achieve, I think they're in a net zero position where they actually generate as much or more electricity than they use. So the microgeneration regulation only applies for when you install the system. So you can put a system on the building at that at that time could offset 100%. Later, if you manage to reduce your consumption, whatever you make above that, you get to keep now. Okay, so you could actually be in a position where you actually generate more electricity than you're using. Okay, that's the way the regulation is designed. Our graph here on a monthly basis over the course of a year. These numbers are kilowatt hours for a month. The blue is typically what you would consume. So this is a consumption pattern in blue. And in green, this is a generation pattern. So as most people I think realize that if your system was uh, installed here, you wouldn't make as much electricity in January as you would say in June. Okay, and so you get this nice shape of a little bit of a bell curve. And the consumption is kind of the opposite. We tend to consume a bit more in the winter time than we do in the summertime. And so, uh, because the days are shorter, so we have the lights on for longer and we tend to have a lot more heat on and other things like that. And so, if you, if you added up all these numbers together, all the blue numbers and all the green numbers, you would actually find that they're the same. And so that's how this works when we do an annual calculation. So it's not intended for every single day to offset what you consume that day. It's intended to do it over the course of a year. Okay. From an electrical side, this is pretty much, this is again, Queen Alexandra Community Lake. This is, they already had this breaker panel here in their electrical room. And they just had this another little box here installed next to it. And this is what's known as the inverter. That takes your DC power from the roof and converts it into AC power, which is what the building uses. So again, no need for batteries. You can run everything in the building off of your solar. And so then all of a sudden, if you had an electric lawnmower, you have a solar powered electric lawnmower. If you're cutting the grass during the daytime, everything in the building becomes solar powered right out of the box, okay? The way we get value from this the most, as I mentioned, is that you can use your own generation, you can consume it all, and it's, it's just, there's nothing that you do as a building owner or consumer, you don't have to pick and choose how this works, it just naturally does this. The way electricity works, you have it flowing in from the utility and you'll have it flowing into your building from the roof, from your solar. Because your roof is closer, that's what gets used first. If you're consuming more than you're generating, it's topped up from the utility. So if you're using a thousand units of electricity and you're generating 500 units of electricity at that time, you're gonna get another 500 from the utility. And the opposite is true. If you're consuming 500, generating a thousand, you're gonna then export the difference. You're gonna export that 500, okay? It just does this all the time. So if you come in, turn on the lights, and that makes a difference, that balance will change. Turn on the stove, all that stuff will change, okay? But because of this, because this is the way this works, what's great about this from a branding point of view and from a community league point of view is that you basically then become a generation source for your neighborhood. So even if your neighbors don't want it or don't believe in it or whatever, you're basically greening your whole neighborhood. You're providing green electricity to the buildings that are closest to your hall, okay? And so they get that benefit from you. And they don't do anything. They just buy electricity from EPCOR, but your green electricity is on the grid. And it, because it's closer than a coal plant in a Wattman or someplace, they'll take your green electricity first, okay? And that's a nice value for the community leaks. This is a, Electricity bill, it's actually my old one. And so because of this, it's from EPCOR. It's a long, it's quite old, it's 2014. So things have changed a lot. Um, what's really changed is delivery charges have gone up. They've probably doubled since this time. A lot of that is to do with uh, infrastructure that gets built. One that comes to mind for most of us is that the big towers that got built between Shore Park and Edmonton, um, that shows up in your bill. So as soon as that gets finished and completed, it goes to the delivery charges. So every time those kinds of upgrades are done, we all pay for it. And that's one of the reasons the delivery charges took a big jump, okay? 
the energy is deregulated. And so this does fluctuate and can fluctuate. Okay. So right now on this example, it shows that the energy is more than the delivery, but on, on a new bill, it would be the opposite. The delivery would be more than the energy. Okay. The reason I show this is because most people have an EPCOR bill. And the reason mine is so old is because I don't use EPCOR as a retailer. Okay. So within the market, there are really three players, as I show on the left here. There's generators who generate the electricity. There's distributors who deliver the electricity. And then there's the retailer. And the retailer is the person or the company whose logo is on the bill. Okay. Now below the retailer is this thing which is called a solar club retail plan. And this really changes the economics here in Alberta. And so there are some retailers, not everyone, but some that offer accelerated pricing. Okay. So this is what I use for my office and my house. I have both a net zero home and a net zero office. I don't have gas in either which is quite unusual for Alberta. So everything, all my heating, all my cooking, everything is coming from electricity. It's all offset by solar for both sites. And I belong to a special retailer, which has this solar club retail plan. Last year, they were paying 19 cents kilowatt hour. So versus five, six cents was what, I, what we're paying in the winter time. In the summertime, I change my rate plan. So as soon as I start to generate more electricity than I'm consuming on a monthly basis, I switch my rate plan. And because of that, this is the impact. So these are my delivery charges. If I didn't have solar, my charges would be in green. So fairly steady here, but because I have solar and because I can do both export the excess and reduce the delivery charges, I get into a position here where they pay me for several months of the year, okay? So I reduce, you see here in March, I'm reducing how much I would normally pay in that month. Same in October, same in November, same in December, same actually even in January. It's only in February where it was the same. So for almost 11 months of the year, I've reduced my costs, okay? versus if I didn't have solar. And in here, this is the entire, or this is the electricity charge and my credits. So the previous one was delivery, and this is now my charge to my credits. And you can see, this is really where I gain is on the energy charges, huge amounts in the summertime. Then when I go to this pie chart, this is the total, this is a whole year, okay? And what this basically says, over the course of the year, I had no bill. I actually made $85 with electricity, okay? So I didn't pay, of course, some months I had a bill, some months I had a credit. And so over the course of the year, when I add it all up, I actually made $85 on the electricity for my building. This is possible to do with community leagues as well. So from a community league point of view, if you see that you have um, one of your big financial challenges is paying your utility, utility bills. You can see that actually solar could be a reasonable investment, that it actually has a value to the league after a certain point, okay? So from a design consideration, there's just a few factors that are important. Obviously the sun. In terms of the sun, what's important is the orientation. Which way does it face? What's the angle that the roof is at and how much shade do you have in your property? Okay. Now, most of us think of solar that it has to be installed on the south side. And that's actually not necessarily true. The advantage of being so far north, as most of us realize, is that the sun in the summertime, the sun comes up pretty much in the north, northeast, and then it sets in the northwest. Okay. And because in the winter time, that's really only 10% of our potential. Well, that means that 90% of our potential is in the time of the year when the sun's coming up in the east to the northeast and setting in the west to the northwest. So the days, those long days, 
if your system actually faces east-west, you can really take advantage of that. So these are two examples. The blue curve is if a system faces south, and the purple curve here is a system that faces east and west. So half of it's east, half of it's west. That's the little dotted lines. And if you did the math on this, this little blue dot and this little yellow dot adds up to this purple line. Okay, and so this purple is very close to what the blue is. This system on the right that faces east-west is slightly larger, but not significantly larger. And so you can actually see, in this case, the one on the left is seven kilowatts and the one on the right is eight kilowatts, okay? And they almost produce the same amount of electricity, and this happens to be in the summertime, okay, as an example. There are other times of the year where it doesn't quite match, but it, doesn't, it means that if your building doesn't face south, you don't have to knock it down, okay? Solar can compensate for that a lot. It's also true if you have a shady site with trees and stuff like that that you can't cut down. There are technology that can compensate for that. A lot of stuff we think, oh, we'll put it on a roof, a flat roof, that works too. The only thing to consider here is that this is supposed to be a little solar panel here and this is a little solar panel here. And the distance between them is four meters if they're tilted too much. In this case, it's 30 degrees. And so what you see on flat roofs today is that we actually have them quite flat, five degrees or so, because then you can put the rows together closer and you get more solar on the roof. So if you have a roof, a community league with a flat roof, they work really well too. Again, you, you lay them down a little bit flatter so you can get them closer together so you can get more solar panels on the same amount of square footage of your roof. You still make good electricity your system has to be a bit bigger because it's not quite as efficient, but it still works quite well. So here's the office at the Edmonton Federation Community Leagues. This is their tiny little array, but it works, generates electricity. One of the challenges they have here, this is very, very typical of an existing building. They have this big shady tree here, which the city owns. All the community leagues know this. The city won't cut that tree down. Um, so, and the other thing they have up here is air conditioning units. And so all these little things across the roof. And so all this stuff reduces the amount of solar that you could put on the roof, okay? This system that on here was installed in 2012, it's intended to be a demonstration project. So by no means is this intended to offset all of the EFCL admin buildings uh, energy. But this is one of the challenges when you live in a city of trees. Um, but we can get around that. Here's some examples of systems um, that you would see. If I look at number one here, this is a typical commercial roof, a typical installed system. It's a fisheye lens, so it's curved. The solar panels are actually straight, but in order to capture the whole roof, uh, you see this curvature in it. They're just laid flat at five degrees. And in this case, they're weighed down with concrete pavers, okay? And I don't remember if I have that slide still. I think I do. I'll show you a reason why you weigh them down. Uh, in this case, we don't bolt through the roof. They're just weighted down, and that way your roof won't leak. This is a specially engineered product for this, designed for this. And on this, this is the, um, this shiny silver thing here happens to be a wind deflector. So the wind doesn't get under it and lift it off the roof. Okay. Number two, this is an asphalt shingle roof. This is what's this silver thing here is what's known as a flashing kit. And it is like a shingle. It, it dovetails into the shingles. And if you use a product like that, which is specifically designed for this, this is actually screwed into the rafters so that it doesn't blow off. And that flashing kit um, eliminates the risk of it leaking. So uh, below it, number four, this is a metal roof. So if you had a metal roof with a standing seam, this little product here clamps to the seam. There's no penetrations in the roof, and that's how it stays on the roof. And then on the third here, this is a custom system that's at a 45 degree tilt, and again, concrete pavers holding it down. So that's typically how it, why it does it. And one of the reasons we do that kind of stuff is one of the big problems with solar is wind lift, okay? So here's an example of what happens if you don't weigh them down properly. Um, this system behind, it all looked like this at one time, okay? And then the wind came along. You don't see any concrete on this. There's no concrete pavers on this. The wind just took this and tossed it off to the side. 
basically destroyed the whole thing. Okay. And so that's really what we have to watch when we do, uh, when we design for this. Uh, this is a roof here. I'm showing this for a good reason. Um, commercial building. And this is one rental office. And then next door, there's another rental office. You see here this little awning. And this was properly designed. We use engineers, structural engineers, to ensure that it's properly designed. And it's weighted down with concrete. And the reason we do this is because a little bit later, a good windstorm came along, picked that awning up that was on the roof and blew it against the solar array. But the solar array never moved, okay? So just an illustration that um, you can design for all the challenges around solar, okay? If you do a ballast system, which is what we use with the concrete paver, and if you have a community league that has a flat roof, the one thing you really got to be careful of, and that's your installer should know this, is that whether the roof will hold up the weight of all that extra concrete, okay? That is a legitimate concern, okay? Particularly when you have a hall with a large open span, we do have to be careful about how much weight you put and where you put it on the roof. And this is the reason that uh, structural engineers are involved, to ensure that that's okay, all right? Here's another system we see occasionally in this part of the world, and it's a little hard to tell from this picture, but this is supposed to be north-south along the ridge of this, and so these face east-west. And because they're back-to-back -back like this, they're actually a natural wind deflector. And so this type of system actually requires a lot less concrete because it's naturally a wind deflector because of the angle, okay? And so this, if your roof is such that you can't put a lot of weight on it, there are alternatives, okay? And this is what's known as dual east-west uh, racking. All this stuff is available. Here is another feature which I strongly recommend to community leagues. Most community leagues have an internet connection and so most inverter systems, solar systems today come with monitoring. It's really great if you can publish this information on your websites. Um, it also allows your installers to get error notifications. So if your systems have a problem, basically your installer gets an email saying, hey, there's something wrong with this. Uh, for the community league itself, it's really great to know this, the, the environmental benefits. Here's some information that's fairly typical for most of the inverters, how much carbon offset you're offsetting. Um, equivalency to say how many trees would that be that are planted? Or in this case, how many light bulbs that are powered? Some of them say how many, um, kilometers of road transportation, it, it's uh, negated. Uh, the, there's an image here that you can also push. It's not a great image, but uh, this happens to be Evansdale Community League. And uh, below this is four or five years, looks like one, two, three, four, five, five years of comparative analysis of how much they've generated. And you can kind of see that uh, it, there is some variability between this between the years and um, and that's factored into the design calculation as well and so we're kind of looking at a mean over 25 years which is typically the life of the system okay but you can see it's pretty reproducible pretty reproducible okay obviously in the shoulder seasons um, in the winter season sorry um, the snow can make a big impact and one thing that uh, surprises a lot of people is that March is actually a very good year here. That's obviously our equinox. 22nd of March is when uh, the first day of spring. And then in September is the other equinox, okay? And in the solstice is in June, of course. But you can see between March and September, this is the bulk of your annual generation, okay? And certainly October is good as well. Uh, some examples of things that might be considered non-standard that you can do with solar as well. Uh, number one here is a shade pergola. Uh, this is a residential house. Um, had a lot of heat coming in this, the south facing door. And this was put up as shade. This is a translucent solar module. 
And so it actually makes electricity on both sides. So if there's snow on the ground and it's reflecting off that or light colored deck or something like that, any light or any sunlight that's reflected off can also generate electricity as well. But it also kind of looks nice. Um, the second one here is an awning on a wall. So uh, if you want, especially if you have a flat roof, nobody can see your solar that you've got up there, you might want to put something like this on the wall so that people realize that you have solar. So it's a great way of um, promoting the idea to the community. Uh, three and four are something a little unusual. This is an actual handrail around the perimeter of a rooftop, uh, a high rise downtown. And um, they also are bifacial, so they're also semi-translucent, and they also generate electricity from both sides. They just happen to be mounted vertically. Uh, here's another uh, picture of a vertical wall of solar panels. And behind it, you can kind of see this picture, which is in number six, which is a, uh, also, again, a translucent pergola uh, up on the roof, on a rooftop garden. This happens to be actually 15 stories in the air which is one of the highest installed systems in almost in the world. I, I don't know of too many systems in Canada that are installed at 15 stories because of the wind. It's very windy up there, but it just shows that you have lots of options. Okay. So that's basically the slideshow. And I'm going to turn over the display back to Mike somehow and then we, are we going to ask questions next, Mike? Yeah, um, I will. Uh, I'll read out Joanne's question, and then I've uh, I've got a few follow up questions for you as well um, that I've that I've kind of jotted down just to. Okay, I'll stop sharing a few more things. Um, so um, Joanne asks, uh, would we be able to cover the consumption at another location we pay for? So I, I assume what you're referring to, Joanne, is. Um, if if the league has um, two separate bills at at different locations, is that is that um, is that right? Well, we've got a building, um, and then we also pay for um, a light at um, a, par a a nearby park, okay. and it all comes on the same bill with Epcor. Right. So it's okay. probably when you say nearby, it's probably like just outside the building. Uh, no, it's about five or six blocks away. Oh, really? That far? Yeah. And it's on the same bill? Yes. Wow. So it shows that, dif that the different right. addresses. Right. Okay. One, it's, it's at one of the storm ponds, and it used to be used for a skating rink. Okay. So um, that's why we had the light installed there. Okay. okay. Uh, there is a, there is a, a um, section of the microgeneration regulation which allows you to what they call aggregate addresses. It was intended for say farmers who maybe have a farmstead in one and a grain dryer on or something like that on another uh, adjacent property. The challenge to that is that it gets a little tricky in the cities because it's supposed to be on the same distribution line. And so it could be that five blocks away, you're still on the same distribution line. It's possible though that you're not. So that's a little tricky one to but in theory, you would be able to combine both. So you'd be able to take the total consumption and make the system on the community league a little bit larger to offset that other light, okay? But without actually asking EPCOR uh, whether we, that could be aggregated or not, I, I can't really tell you. Okay, okay. the potential is there. But the potential is there and okay. it's allowed for that. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, okay, so Warren, if you don't mind, I've just got a couple. Um, sure. First, I'll just say that that uh, that east-west system that deflects the wind, right? That you showed. That's I've never seen that before. That's super super cool. Oh, no? no, I've it's never. It became popular. You the advantage of it is that you can. So there was a, a move about mm, five six years ago to, to put systems down flat, and if you know the Mosaic Center, yeah system is flat but if you think about it it takes up this much square area and if you tilt it a little bit it actually takes up a little bit less square footage and right. so you can actually get more on the roof if you tilt it a little bit and the other advantage you have is because there's a slight tilt to it the dirt and moisture run off and so they actually stay cleaner one of the challenges you have the mosaic center is that it actually gets pretty dusty 
and the water doesn't run off of it. And so the dust kind of accumulates in the corners and stuff. Mm -hmm. So this type of a system, you would actually get a little bit higher density on it. And in parts of the world where you, you're making money off solar, that makes a big difference, okay? But yeah, because, sorry. Yeah, but because we're so far north, that east-west orientation really looks good. Also, if the building is slightly rotated, um, they can follow the line of the building and they maybe aren't quite northwest and east-west facing, but it doesn't matter. And so you can actually get a much more efficient array out of a building that's maybe rotated uh, slightly. Like a, a flat roof building, obviously. Flat roof building, yeah. yeah. Cool. Unfortunately, we don't design buildings for solar, uh, sadly. So uh, yeah. you know, the vast bulk of the products available are for retrofitting to existing buildings. And so there's lots of solutions out there. Right. Cool. Um, yeah. So, um, so I just wanted to ask the, the PV net credit that for, uh, that you have on your home and your, and, uh, evergreen and gold there. Yep. Did, did I, uh, did I see it right that you're getting paid for delivery charges or cause you had the delivery that's charge. That's the way it's shown. Um, it's because, um, we, it's it's kind of an excess amount of credit so it's it's um we generated so much in one month that we're actually getting a, it, it it exceeds the delivery so the way it's graphically shown it shows up as right. a credit okay okay Does that okay, makes sense cool. yeah yeah i think i think that's what you're, what you're getting out there i was just curious and, and what it was was it's we're taking our consumption that we're using we're saying okay we don't pay for that. And so that shows up as a credit. That's maybe a better way to explain it. So right. instead of showing it as a, an avoided cost, it actually shows up as a credit instead. So then that's why it's negative. Okay. Right. Just to illustrate that, that you actually get a value. So on those months when we have a high consumption, we have less consumption. But for those months where we have a really tiny consumption, we're still getting value for that. Okay? Right. That's what mm -hmm. we're trying to illustrate. Okay. Great. Um, and then, um, the, the one other question I had, if you don't mind, just cause I think I've heard this concern brought up by certainly a lot of homeowners. Um, and I think it's, I think it's a big one. Um, like when you're looking at a, uh, flash mounted system. So, so for those of us here, that was the one Warren showed when he was showing the different ways that you can mount it on the roof. The one that kind of mounted in just like a shingle almost. Yeah. I'll and, yeah, I would really, I, I, I wouldn't mind if you could just sort of explain how the leaks are prevented with a system, with, with that sort of mounting system, um, because you are screw drilling into the roof. And, uh, and I think like a lot of people, that's quite a big concern for them, um, understandably so. Um, so you just kind of, kind of just briefly go over why that prevents leakage. Sure. Uh, everybody can see this probably. So this is the one Mike's talking about, number two. And uh, it's a little hard to see this because the picture looks like it's flat, but this is actually looking down the slope. So where the camera is, is near the peak of the roof, okay? And so this, shing this piece of sheet metal here, this aluminum thing, is actually square. And so it projects up underneath this shingle by the, about six inches or so, six or eight inches here. So underneath this little piece here, where my mouse is, is a little bracket that goes on the roof. That is then fastened into the rafter that's below it with a fairly lengthy screw. It's about a three and a half inch lag screw. So fairly substantial screw. It's um, stainless steel, so it won't corrode. And then what's a little hard to see in this picture, there's a neoprene layer between here. We also put uh, roof caulking underneath the flashing itself in a semicircle here so water doesn't penetrate underneath of it. Then there's a neoprene here and a neoprene over the nut and bolt here as well. So this is all sealed and waterproofed under here. And because it is shoved underneath the shingle here, it's like another shingle. Okay, so that alone, the fact that it's underneath a course of shingles, 
does probably 90% of the waterproofing. And then the, the caulking and the neoprene uh, parts of it do the rest of it, okay? Does that kind of make sense? Yeah, that, that makes sense to me. Um, is there, is there an example you could see where you would have leaking? Um, like say something went wrong. Um, the reason I bring it up is just to sort of alleviate so that people can understand how that works. And then that way, you, you know, if, if someone was like, oh no, those are just going to leak if you're drilling into your roof, they can say, well, no, no, no. You know, like maybe if you did it this way, it would leak, but, but that's not how it's done so that it won't. Does that make sense? Yeah. So one of the reasons I actually mentioned this specifically mentioned this in my presentation is that it's a fair bit of cost for the installer. So when you're presented with quotes, multiple quotes, let's say they're all the same price. So the way some installers can make a higher profit is they reduce their costs. And what some installers have done is they don't install the flashing kit. So this other piece on top is called an L, the thing is shaped like a, the letter L is called an L bracket. Um, solar people aren't necessarily the smartest people in the world. So, so we have to make, keep this simple. So this is what's called an L bracket. And uh, what has happened in some places is that they'll just bolt that right to the roof and eliminate the flashing kit. There's two reasons for that. It's less material, so it doesn't cost as much for the material. It's a lot quicker to do it. It's only a very simple one step rather than three or four steps, let's say, okay? And so from a prudence point of view, when you're in due diligence, when you're, if you're the person for the community league who's trying to purchase this stuff, this is something you wanna make sure is that you're um, racking if you have a shingled roof, that your racking includes what's known as the flashing kit, because this is this square, big square piece of aluminum. The presumption always is, when you're looking for quotes for any contractor, you should make sure that they have some insurance coverage. Um, the minimum is workers' compensation. The reason you want workers' compensation is if they, they or their staff get hurt on the job, they're not allowed to sue the community league. They're not allowed, to, if you're a homeowner or if you're a, a property owner and the, any contractor has workers' compensation, the value of that is actually so that the homeowner can't be sued. They're legally not allowed to sue the homeowner if their staff get hurt on the job, okay? Workers' compensation pays for it, period, okay? So that's, you want to make sure that they have workers' compensation. And then the second thing is you want to make sure that they have commercial insurance and the commercial insurance would cover anything like a roof leak. So let's just say they don't install this properly or it's not installed as per the manufacturer's recommendations, then you can go back on the installer's insurance to have a roof leak repaired, okay? Rather than the community leaks building insurance pay for it, it should be the installer's insurance that pays for it, okay? And so I would say if an installer has insurance, they probably don't want to have a lot of claims. And so I would hope that they would do a reputable job of installing it. But that's part of the due diligence that you do with hiring any contractor for a community league. Because you want to do your homework. You want to make sure um, you want to get references of work they've done. And if possible, it would be good to go out and actually see the work that they did as well. Okay, it's, it's very important. Um, you know, and if they, for the lay person, it's really difficult to see this stuff and tell the difference, okay? But um, yeah, it, it's a tricky one to, to, to really recommend, but get multiple quotes, ask all these questions, make sure they have insurance, you know, that kind of stuff. It's fairly, I can't remember, Mike, do you guys still have that listed on the, EFCL's website, kind of list of do's and don'ts for that? Um, I'm not sure if, I know, I know there's probably some resources available. I know for, for me on my end, I do have a preferred contractors list I, I put together. Um, and that's got you guys and, um, and a few other companies. And then it, it, it has some solar companies and some energy efficiency, like energy auditing companies and stuff like that. Um, and so those are the ones that, that we've vetted um, and that have quite a bit of experience, both 
both in the industry and have been around for a while as well as working with community leagues. Um, and so that's a great place to start. Um, if, if you're not happy with that list, obviously you're welcome to, to, to go outside that, but then as Warren says, and, and even, even with that list still, I mean, it's, it's at the end of the day, it's, it's up to you. Um, we can help, but, but it is important to do your due diligence, um, with this stuff. And that's also the, the other benefit of that too, is it keeps the city happy because any issues that come up with this stuff, the city's already on the watch and there's already negative attitudes towards some of this technology. Um, just because um, of, of misinformation or, or in some cases, you know, some, some fly by the seat of the, your pants sort of, sort of companies doing, doing some shady stuff. And so, so the, the more projects go well, the, the less red tape we're going to have to go through with the city in the long run, I think. Yeah, specific to solar, Solar Alberta, which is solaralberta.ca. So that used to be the Solar Energy Society of Alberta. Um, they also have some uh, guidelines on there for, for homeowners and businesses and whoever. And so you can certainly refer to their recommendations as well. They also have a preferred contractor list as well, which they vet. Okay. Um, sort of. Sort of. I think that CFL probably does a little bit better job of vetting contractors than Solar Alberta. Solar Alberta is kind of a voluntary code of ethics. So, yeah. Um, and I did hear of, because I know the city was flipping on a little bit last Christmas, I think it was, um, that I know a league did get um, run into a problem with a contractor, I believe, because they paid for something and then never got the work done, I think, right? So, uh, I'm not sure. I know one of the things the city was, was concerned about was actually just a false problem, um, and it was Cloverdale had... Um, a company that had done some work for them had gone under, um, but the work was already paid for and it was actually paid through for by, um, by their project management um, company that they hired sea returns. And so a supplier placed a lien on, on Cloverdale Hall, which then got passed on to the city, but it was not a legal lien because they had already been paid. And because the, the league actually wasn't the one who, ones who contracted it was, it was just basically, sort of nonsense, um, but it, it was just a blanket lien that they decided, the supplier decided to apply to every project that, that that company's name was on. And that created a bunch of problems and the city reacted very quickly. Um, and, and in my opinion, incorrectly. And Justin will probably speak to, to the results of, uh, of that reaction because Inglewood okay. ran into some trouble because of that. You know, it's just like, it's like anything. We just have to do our due diligence, right? Um, it, it happens. It's, it's, it's nothing special. So just because, so just, the thing you keep in mind is just because it seems like everybody who's installing solar is doing it for all the right reasons. So you're saving the planet and all that kind of stuff. It's still um, not perfect, right? There, there is, you know, people within the industry, companies within the industry that you have to kind of watch out for, right? So but it's pretty big, pretty good group. I know most of the people in the industry and it's, it's a pretty decent group. So. Yeah, I would say so too. I mean, the flip side of that is that I think some people view it as like uh, too new of an industry and everyone's just out to, to everyone's out to scam. And, and I don't see it that way either. In fact, I think the vast majority of the companies uh, that I've dealt with anyway, all the, all the ones that are have well-known names in the city are, are quite good and, and run by pretty ethical, well-intentioned people. So, yeah. Um, yeah, so those are, those are the questions I've got for you, Warren. Um, if, if anyone else, if no, or if no one else has any questions, then, um, I think maybe we'll take, uh, we'll take a five minute break and then, uh, pass it over to Justin to, uh, talk about Inglewood's experience and, uh, and, and let us know sort of how it went from, from the league perspective. All right. So, um, yeah, if, if everyone wants to come back at seven thirty-five, and we'll, we'll, uh, Justin will speak then, and then once he's done, I'll, I'll run through a few things and, and uh, do a, a couple of follow-up pieces to sort of some of the things and show some resources I've sent out. So, uh, yeah, see you guys back at 7.35. All right, thank you.
Mike, just wondering before we get started, are we going to get into the cost of in this session, or is there another session that covers the cost? Um, well, I think um, I think Warren Warren could probably speak to that if if you'd like. If he comes back here, I think he will. Or um, I know I'll, Justin's I'll be also been through it, um, so he'll probably go through Inglewood's experience. And and for the typical size that you're likely to see on the community league, it does depend again to Warren's point on. Uh, two factors mainly, um, which is your consumption, because uh, you can't put more up than you consume in a year, and then also your your roof space. Um, so, uh, and then also like how much you'll need based on orientation and things like that. Other factors, but um, but I don't know. I mean, I mean, Warren, um, now that you're back, maybe um, you could speak, Joanne, just just had asked about um, about cost. So, you know, tip, depending on the size of the system, what, what do you figure is typical? Yeah, so where it gets a little tricky, you, got, you have to keep in mind when I was talking about power versus energy. So that ratio is determined by the efficiency of the site. Okay, so I was showing the map where how we compare to Germany. So that's an efficiency just between us and Germany. Okay, but also within this area, there's also efficiencies. Okay. So as an example, my office, we did it in 2010 and we paid $8 a watt installed for the system. We installed, but that's that was the price at the time. Uh, today, it would be somewhere between $2 and $2.50 a watt for the same thing. So in those days, it was about $65,000 and today that would be about $20,000. $20,000, dollars $20, So that's how much has come down, okay? The challenge with giving you a fixed price on it is it, the bigger the systems, the better the dollar per watt is, okay? So the smaller systems, there's a fair amount of um, built-in costs. And so, as I kind of mentioned, we have to do structural engineering, we have to do permitting, we have to do all that. We have to pull an electrical permit, we have to get it inspected. There's a lot of just overhead costs. And so there's the problem is, is that little systems, um, it's almost not worth doing. And so, um, but you don't have to get very big before you start to get into some really efficient prices, okay? Um, it, you could see something in the $2 a watt range. That would not surprise me. It, you could see something below that. We're getting kind of at that point where uh, quite honestly, I think if you got a quote in the winter time before an installer has filled up their order book for this summer, you would get a better price than if you called somebody in August. If you called somebody in August and said, can I get you to install this next week? They would probably give you the most outrageous price just so you would go away. Okay. So some of it is that. Okay. So if you call them in February and say, what's, what's the price? and they don't have any orders yet, or not very many, then they want to keep the crews busy. And so that's I, that's a little tip. I would say contact them in the late fall if you, want to, if you want one for the next year and start talking to installers, get a couple of quotes and make sure you understand why there's differences in prices between them, okay? But because it's, because it's priced on a dollar per watt basis, one of the problems with that is that it's um, it doesn't speak to the complexity of it, okay? And so I have seen quotes from installers where they've said, here's the price, and it'll be 100% of it. But then when you read the fine print, it's 100% of what they quoted you, but it's half the size of another quote they got because the other quote is twice as big. Okay. And so you kind of have to, you kind of have to watch that. Okay. And so I think the best thing to know is to figure out how much you use in a year, how many kilowatt hours you use in a year. I don't have any, I have an example, which I could find fairly quickly, but on most bills, there's a bar graph that shows Electricity at a glance is what EPCOR calls it. And it's like a bar graph every month for the last two years. 
And if you did quick math on it, you can kind of figure out from that and add it all up and you've got a rough number. So that say in a course of a year, you use 30,000 kilowatt hours. And then when you get quotes back, so your installer should ask for that. If they do not ask for a copy of your electricity bill, then I would not believe their quote. They should also come out to your site and look at the building because the other problem with community leagues, as most people who volunteer in a community league understand, they weren't given the best buildings from the city necessarily. And so there's lots of challenges. And so there could be some hidden electricity costs in there too. So, so the solar could be one price and then to tie into the electrical system could be an extra. Okay. So your installer should for sure get your address and your electricity bill, copy your electricity bill, and they should come out to the site and see the site. Okay. For sure. All right. And then for your own due diligence, make sure you're comparing apples to apples to apples. So if you get three quotes, you make sure that they're all the same size. Okay. Because I have seen that before where companies will quote a big, because to make it faster the quote, they just quote one size. So they go, okay, here's the price. And, but you don't realize that that's half the size that you actually need. Okay. So you think, Hey, that's a great price. And you go with that one and then your system's not big enough. The other observation I would make is that most people, you can go smaller, you can go smaller and you can add to systems over here. So Evansdale, they actually did it in two steps. Um, they got two separate grants, but most people, when they look at this, they right off the bat, they're doing hundred percent offset. That's what they're looking for. It, otherwise they just don't bother. Right. Especially if you have a budget, needs, typically if you have a budget instead, you, you can also say to somebody, what do I get for $20,000? You can also do it that way too. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yeah, but if I say I got twenty thousand dollars, then they'll just spend it all. Sure, they're not going to give me any change back. <laughs> but uh, if you get several quotes, again, you have to do comparison, right? So what do I get for twenty thousand, right? And um, you, you're probably better off to ask for the hundred percent first, and then if it's more than your budget is, then you say, okay, I can't afford that. How about what can you do for me for? $20,000 and it should be proportional. Okay. Okay. Right. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Sorry, Joanne, I was just going to say, you know, in terms of first steps, when, when leagues approach me and ask, you know, well, we're interested, what do I do? The first thing I say is you get, get one or more site assessments done. Um, because typically that's, that's free of charge, um, in the industry. And so they will come out and they'll take a look. Uh, usually they should, um, and they'll look at what you're consuming and they'll say, okay, like this is, you know, roughly what, what we could expect to produce and, and what it would cost you. And, and you kind of get that assessment done. And then, and then from there, you, you move on. That's, that's step one. And then you start saying, okay, well, if we want to go ahead with this, what else do we need to do? And that's applying for grants, talking to the city, doing your community engagement and, and all that stuff. Um, but, but you will know before you, it's not like something where you're going to pull the trigger on something without knowing what it's going to cost and what you can expect typically, I would say. Some companies want down payments. Sometimes, sometimes they want additional payments when they deliver and stuff like that. And so, you know, you gotta, you gotta, yeah, you have to make decisions on that. So when you're comparing quotes, that's some other things that you might want to compare. What's the length of the warranty? Um, what does the warranty cover? There's usually warranty on the material, warranty on the labor. Um, most of the components have a manufacturing defect warranty of 10 years, sort of. Uh, some components go as, more, as high as 20 years. For instance, the racking, it's just metal. So it has a 20 year warranty against manufacturer's defects. Some of the more expensive parts have a 10 year warranty, but the solar modules themselves have a 25 year warranty. Almost every solar mo module manufacturer in the world um, follows the same thing. They'll guarantee, one thing I didn't mention is solar modules actually degrade, their performance drops over time. They're, they degrade um, due to ultraviolet radiation from the sun, ironically. So if you want your solar to last forever, you put it inside. It doesn't make a lot of electricity, but it will last a long time. Um, so if you put it on the roof, 
it's going to degrade over time, but it's a predictable amount and it's linear. And so all the manufacturers say for the first um, 25 years, you're going to lose 20% of the uh, factory value. So if you bought a solar panel, it was a hundred Watts. After 25 years, it would produce 80 Watts. Okay. What's important about that is that if you have a roof that would last for 50 years, there's no reason to take the solar off. You could leave it up there. So if a community league was considering re-roofing and putting solar on, I would strongly recommend considering a metal roof. Okay. Um, Justin's going to talk about that with Inglewood. I, uh, I was, I did some site assessment on behalf of the UFCL for Inglewood and that I strongly recommended that they consider putting a metal roof on it. They were due for a roof. And so it, because they did that, that system then sh should be able to stay on there for probably 50 years. Okay. Now it will degrade over those 50 years, but it will still ha produce 60, 70% of the original value. Okay. So that's one of the misperceptions that we have too, is that solar, it only lasts so long. It actually lasts a very long time. Okay. It's, the life of it is usually determined by the, what it's bolted, what it's mounted on. Okay. Flat roofs, usually good for about, depending on what material the roof is made from, is usually somewhere between 20 and 30 years as a flat roof. Shingled roof, asphalt shingled roof is 20 to 25 years and a metal roof more like 50 years. Okay. And um, it actually, it, solar, when it covers the roof, it extends the life, particularly asphalt roofs. It extends the life because again, you're protecting the roof from the ultraviolet. It's usually the ultraviolet radiation that reduces the lifespan of the roof. So by putting solar on top of it, the solar degrades, but the roof lasts a little bit longer. Does that make sense? The other thing I would add there, and, and Warren, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, is that the a, a big part of the solar getting it done, the cost is labor and racking. And so even if the modules degrade to 70% and, and your roof is still good, because you put up a metal roof, uh, the racking should likely be good as well. And then it's just a matter of someone coming in and swapping out those modules, which because the modules themselves have come down in price so much over the past couple of decades, um, it is not like a, it's, it's not going to cost you the amount that it would cost to install the system fresh, I guess is my point. That's true. Um, you would have to make sure that there hasn't been significant corrosion. Uh, that would be my only concern on an older system that now it, all the material is aluminum and stainless steel. And we use materials that are intended to last a long time. And so the, let's say the design lifespan for solar is 30 years. Um, if you were to take the system off, it, it hasn't, it's not yet there, but once the scale of solar gets to be a certain amount, there's going to be a used market for it. So you could have a system that's 20 years old, 20 years from now, you could have a system that's 20 years old, you take it off, you sell it to somebody who has a cabin. Um, if they're only going there on the weekends or something, okay, they probably don't need a brand new system. They could buy a used system and put it on their cabin as an example. Okay. So that's the important thing to keep in mind is that there actually is a value to it even after 20 years. Okay. And if you can leave it on there and the thing works and doesn't break down or anything like that, it just continues to make electricity. It's just making you free electricity. Okay. So. Yeah, and if the system pays back in 10, 15 years, then after that, even if they're degrading, it's all just profit at that point anyway, so. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, Justin, I'll, I, I will thank, thanks a lot, Warren. I really appreciate appreciate you coming in today, and uh, and I think, I hope that was useful. I certainly found it, found it very useful, uh, even for myself, so. Um, so Justin, uh, he's, he's uh, on the board of Inglewood Community League. Um, they, they just put up solar last fall, so he's going to talk about a bit about their experience. And um, and Justin, don't worry, we're, we're not at an hour and a half like we did the last two, because I realized I wasn't doing them for long enough. So I don't know if you're there for those, but we're we're good till um, till at least eight thirty, and then if people want to stick around, they can. Um, so just just take your time and 
yeah, don't don't worry about time too much. I can always cut my my end short. So. Okay. Um, let's see. Do you have to give me permission to share my screen? You should be good now that I that I changed that. I think. Uh, oh, there it is. Share my screen. Share. Okay. So I've got a bunch of different things to share. Um, and I'll be jumping around a little bit. So hopefully, hopefully this goes relatively smooth. Um, so I'll be talking about a few things. Um, one is from the project management point of view. Um, that was a lot more than a lot, lot more work than I anticipated. Um, it it becomes the bulk of the work. Um, and getting all the getting all the grants written or grant applications written and making sure your funding comes through um, working with the board scheduling things it all kind of has to fit together like a little jigsaw puzzle and i apologize for the lighting where i am um you can't see me very well but um I'll focus on the presentation instead um so this this first presentation here, I'll talk about uh, just a little bit about project management and uh, all all the different steps that we took to go through. Um, and then after that, I'll have the presentation that I gave to my board of directors, which was basically used to sell them on the idea and get approval for the funding. Um, I'll I'll be providing a copies of both of these presentations to everybody, as well as a few other documents I've put together. Um, so here's a picture of our completed array. Uh, as you can see, we did in fact go for the metal roof. Um, one interesting thing about the, um, the, the racking that Warren didn't mention is they dropped our price by about $3,000 for metal roof racking compared to the shingles um, and, the, and the flashing. So depending on how your budget is split up and, and where your funding sources come from, that actually helped us a little bit for uh, getting the getting the solar approved. Um, the metal roof costs two and a half times as much, so you're not actually saving money, but um, for this part of the project, it did. Um, one other interesting thing about this is you can see up on the left there that uh, our, our chimney stack, um, we weren't sure whether or not it was going to be worthwhile to put the, put a couple panels right behind it there due to shadowing. And it turns out in the summer months, um, there's hardly any shadowing on it. Uh, the sun goes directly overhead and those ones behind it are uh, just as productive as, um, as any of the other ones. So in the winter, they produced a little bit less, but in the summer, not a, not a huge concern. Um, so the entire process took about 16 months from start to finish. And that was um, from doing our initial research to um, all, all the way through completing the project. Um, and you could possibly say that uh, we still haven't finished the project yet because we're still looking to do some more community engagement, um, putting up information inside the hall about it. Um, reporting on on our first year of production so it's kind of a kind of a project that never really ends but getting the installation and um, get, getting it operational took about 16 months um, so this is where we'll be talking about so the general timeline um, these are probably where you'll be starting as well uh, these um, q1 uh, so, so Q4 being October, November, December um, is, I, I recommend starting around these and that's all based around all the grant applications being due in, um, in Q2. So May, April, May, June, all, seems like all the grant applications uh, are due then. So you have, you have to do all your homework and get all your quotes and, get all your approval and get everything, all your paperwork done, ready for all those grant applications in Q2. Um, and then ready for your project execution uh, throughout the summer or possibly into the fall. 
we were uh, we originally hoping to do our installation in June, but then it got pushed out to almost October just due to scheduling conflicts and working with the city. But uh, the, the biggest thing you have to work around is getting is, is all those grant applications in the spring. Um, so yeah, like, uh, like Michael said, the, one of the first things you want to do is figure out the size of the system that you're hoping to get and its relative cost. Um, make sure that you have enough money in the bank to, um, to do it. Uh, we were able to use our casino funding for most of it, um, as well as uh, a couple grants. Um, but, but the bulk will come from your, your casino funding. So uh, now, now that COVID's here and casinos are all pushed back and funding is tight, um, this might push your project back a little bit, maybe push it back a year while, you're, uh, while you have to refill your coffers or just wait for the economic conditions to settle down a little bit. Um, but that might just give you some extra time to, to plan the project. Um, production estimates. Uh, an important thing is that when you, when you get your quote from the installer, uh, they'll always give you a, a production estimate. Um, I always wanted to make sure that, that a lot of them didn't give information backing up where their estimates came from. Um, they just came from simulations. Uh, so I, I asked our installers for some uh, some case studies, some real world, world examples that kind of matched our system and uh, uh, was able to come back with um, a revised number of what we should actually be expecting to produce. And I, I found it was about 10 to 15% lower than what they were expecting or, or what, what, their, um, what their estimations were from the original thing. Um, not sure why. An installer would want to overestimate what what the production would be. Um, in theory, if they underestimated it, they could sell you more panels. So maybe Warren could comment on that, but that's that's kind of what what I found. So good to have case studies to to back up those claims. Um, did did you want to comment on that, Warren? Or? Sure. Uh, sorry, I don't want to interrupt, but that, no, that is ahead. accurate. Eleven hundred is is reasonable ballpark. I would say anywhere between eleven a thousand and eleven hundred is is what I would expect. Real world. And you're right. Most people are using simulation software, and it's way too much. It's usually saying something like thirteen hundred, fourteen hundred fifty uh, kilowatt hours a year. If you look at that map I showed, it's twelve fifty at best in Edmonton. So anything yeah. that's over twelve fifty, they're just dreaming <laughs> yeah um the installers um they all know what price points are out there in the market and they all know the price point they need to hit to be competitive um so we found that all all the quotes we got were roughly in the same ballpark um they didn't vary by more than a couple percent um make sure you get at least three quotes um you probably might have to even approach more installers because um after we we talked to a few of them um two out of the four we talked to um s sort of dropped out of uh contention so you might might have to contact a few more now might have just i think it was when we were getting quotes, it was right before the change in provincial government and all the installers were doing lots of quotes and they were all really busy. Um, everyone was trying to get the, their, their home systems in before the, um, before the energy efficiency Alberta rebates were canceled. So that might have been, that was, that was probably part of it, but you'll, you'll want three for at least for your grant applications and um, just for your own peace of mind. Um, and I think one of the best pieces of advice I had regarding picking your installer is um, you just want to pick the company that it, it has less to do with price, but the company that you, you get the best feeling from, um, you're, you're basically entering into a 10, 20 plus year relationship with them um, to, to monitor your system. So it's, um, that's, that's really what you want to be evaluating them for at the end of the day, um, all else being equal. 
with the with the parts and the technology aside. Uh, funding sources. So these were the four main uh, funding sources that we went through. Um, actually, it's missing one. Well, the, the last one is the um, um, our our AGLC casino money that we were able to use to to top up everything that we weren't able to get. But um, the, the 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 top two, the MCCAC. Um, I believe they were, they thought they were running out of uh, money, but I believe they are still accepting applications at this time. I, do, you, do you know if that's the case? Yes, so they've continually just managed to move money around. Um, they kept telling me it's gonna run out, it's gonna run out, it's gonna run out. And I still think that that's the case. Um, I think they're, they're living on borrowed time but they have managed to kind of continually just move money around to replenish that pot uh, as opposed to asking the province to, to replenish it themselves because the province is just never going to do that uh, right now. Um, so right now, as far as I know, as of maybe two months ago, I got, I got word from, from some people I know at MCCAC saying that you should be good. Like still, if you're interested, get expressions of interest in, but it's not, it's not like about to fall away in the next two weeks or anything like that. So I still think if you're interested, you, you want to act soon, uh, at least for this grant. But I don't think that it's like going to disappear overnight at this point. It's just, you know, maybe within the next three to six months to a year, depending on if they can get more money put into it. And depending also on the size of projects, because that grant also goes towards municip mostly towards municipalities and they tend to build very large systems. So if you have, you know, a few three, $4 million projects, the money can disappear really quickly. So there's a few factors, but as far as I know right now, there's still money there. Okay. Yeah. So that's, that's a good, easy one. It's not a lot of work to get the money, you give them a little bit of docu documentation, you give them a shout out on your website and, and, and they're happy. Um, from the city of Edmonton, their, their clip grant, um, most community leagues, you guys should be familiar with this. You probably apply for them every year. Um, we applied for the small grant, which only gave us up to 25K because um, I wanted to free us up for projects this year and future years, which are now not happening. So um, we should have applied for a, for a large one and got more, more money paid for a couple of years ago. That's, that's, that's part of the jigsaw puzzle of figuring out how it all fits. Uh, the last two grants, they're very competitive and we didn't actually get either of them. Um, Eco City Edmonton, they don't really do straight. Uh, a few years ago, they did um, solely solar panel projects, but they're, they're looking for more uh, innovative um, energy efficiency uh, grants nowadays. Um, and for uh, the CFEP, um, they, didn't approve our project and we didn't get a good reason why. Um, and I, I think it's just because it's a pretty competitive project um, uh, grant. They, I think they're, they're oversubscribed by, by three or four times. So, um, a lot part of the work leading up to it once we had once we had our quotes it was uh, selling the project to our board of directors is this what we want to be spending our money on um, so we uh, an important thing give them your vision statement give them a little bit of information about the technology but don't give go into too much detail um, you're going to find some of your board of directors will simply oppose the idea. We had one guy on our board and he just, he didn't believe in solar. That's, that's a direct quote from him. Um, I'm, I'm not sure what that means, uh, but he was a staunch resistance to it. It doesn't exist. Yeah. Uh, um, and there'll be a lot of frequently asked questions from from the board of directors too. Um, I'm actually gonna go, th it, my, my next presentation will be going through a lot more of these in detail for the stuff that uh, Warren hasn't already covered. Um, payment milestones. We, well, all of our installers, they asked for 50% down payment and then 50% upon completion. Um, 
we negotiated it to be 25, 25, and 50, um, just due to the length of the time that the project took to get off the ground. And uh, we needed to get a little bit of preliminary work done up front in order to secure some of our grants. Um, and I think this, this pricing scheme will help alleviate some concerns from the city administration as well as in terms of uh, what risk you're undertaking. So um, worst case, you're only ever losing 25% of the cost of the project if, if something significant happens. Um, and another important part of this is even though it's a very uh, standard, it becoming a more standard uh, piece of construction, you still need to go what's called go through what's called the community group led construction process. Um, when we redid our park a few years ago, um, it's it was a very intensive process. They they actually did a good job of streamlining the process for us, understanding that it's uh, it was it was a pretty minimal. Um, um, uh, low low impact on the community projects, much less than a, a new playground. Um, but they still made us go through a whole bunch of hoops for that. So um, I'm going to be sharing all my all my documents for that as well. Um, the the strategy plan um, was just a ten page document that I that I made up that outlines. The, the plan from start to finish, uh, again, to just help alleviate their, their concerns. Um, and then that last, that last item there, the surety bond, that is something that the, the city administration threw at us at the last minute, um, about 10 months into the, the whole process. And they said, you must have a, a surety bond, also known as a performance bond. Um, which added about 10% or, or $4,000 to the cost of our project. And it's basically insurance as to ins an insurance policy um, for, um, for us in case the installer doesn't do their, doesn't finish and, and, and the work needs to be otherwise completed. Um, I'm going to suggest that any community league that does move forward with, um, um, with, with a solar panel project fights tooth and nail against getting having to get that uh, surety bond. Um, I know Michael as well has been uh, doing his best to, to avoid that, but basically it's it's added no no value to us. Uh, it's and increased the payback period of our project by years. Um, and for for something that's already a minimal risk. Um, yeah, good luck. if you don't mind me saying something just for a second, Justin. So, so we actually don't take any pre down payments. We do 100% upon completion, and that you can avoid the surety bond if you if you can get your contractor to do that, because then you're not there's no risk. Is, yeah, is that, that true with with this? Like my my concern, like like that makes 100% sense to me, Warren. Uh, when it comes to the city of Edmonton, it doesn't always have to make sense. Is that something that you think would be the case dealing with them or they would, because I feel like this just came that I, we had meant, I mentioned Cloverdale and some of the issues they had had. Yeah. I'm quite, I, I don't know. I, th I think that that basically their legal department just was like, get it bonded. Stop. I, we will we'll never worry about this again. It's just kind of a joke, but um, that's crazy. Yeah, I mean, obviously, if it's 100% on completion, that's insane. But, I mean, I just don't know what the city sometimes. <laughs> I think it's, it, it, I think maybe, like, that's probably would be a fantastic way to go and then just really bully the city and just tell them, look, like, we're not even paying for it until it's done. And, and try and push it and get them to maybe do their jobs. I don't know, especially with the NRCs getting cut back. I, I'm even more concerned now that it would be hard to get them to kind of go to bat for you. Uh, in terms of fighting the legal department on this stuff, but yeah, I mean, obviously, you're you're absolutely right that if it's if it's paid for upon completion, there's no. I mean, it's the the, the bond doesn't even make sense at that point. But yeah, it is the city, and and that whole community the community group led construction process that also goes through 
your your NRC and uh, and a city project manager. So uh, with the cutbacks, that's probably going to add delays to your projects as well. Um, last year, it took two months, I think, for them to assign us a project manager after we got those documents in. Um, so that's that was that was just something else that added delays to the project. Um, so this, I'm going to move on to this presentation. It's yeah, it, when I presented it to the board, I think it took over an hour. Um, I'm going to skip over a lot of slides because Warren's already talked about lots of them. Um, but it's basically what I, how I sold the project to our board of directors. Um, state your vision. Excellent. Um, this slide was actually a really big help. Um, some of the more risk averse people were saying, okay, we're not the first people to do this. <clears throat> we're not, we're not cutting edge, but we're not, we're not at the end of the pack either. So we're, um, this, this is, we're, we're not breaking new territory here. And, and that helped alleviate some concerns. And I think even since I made this presentation, there's been a few more uh, added on. Um, Windsor, I know for sure, A uh, little bit of information saying how, how fast prices are dropping and, but will they continue to drop? Maybe they will, maybe they won't. Um, Warren went through this part already, talking about the micro generation rules, um, how it works. Uh, more slides that Warren already covered. Just shows that uh, Edmonton in particular is a pretty good place in Canada to, um, to, to have an array. A um, little bit about, here, here was a picture of our, our league before the uh, installation went in. And I don't think I cover it, but I'll, I'll mention it here. Um, you can see there's a playground right next to us there. Uh, there's, and, and it's a two-story drop off the side of our building. Um, that, was, that was a pretty big concern about slow snow sliding off and, and hitting the kids at the park. Uh, so we had to actually invest in a pretty beefy uh, snow guard system. And uh, that, that added an unexpected cost to the project. I think we paid an extra $3,000 for that. Um, so that's 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 something to keep in mind and try to budget up front and instead of trying to find money for halfway through the project. Um, we you can also see there our, our air, air conditioning units are sitting right on the south side of the roof. Uh, we were actually able to get those moved to the other side um, when we had our roof redone. Uh, so a little bit about the. A little bit about the stats of what we did. Um, the dollars per watt ended up at about 2.5, exactly what uh, Warren was talking about earlier. And then with the rebate, it, it went down to about $1.50 um, per watt is what we actually ended up paying. Um, this number here, the levelized cost of energy, that's um, a somewhat complicated calculation, but at, at the end of the day, this is basically the what you're doing is you're prepaying for your energy for the next 30 years at nine cents per kilowatt hour. Um, and so the, the the retail rates for electricity um, with with the electricity plus the transmission distribution today, those work out to about 15 cents per kilowatt hour. So, you're 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 paying nine versus 15 effectively for the next 30 years. Um, we had to replace our roof, uh, so that was that was another uh, separate discussion that I'm not going to go into detail here. But we ended up choosing a metal roof, even though it was more expensive. Uh, had to move the air conditioning units. Um, actually, I'll just mention this. Uh, we ended up hiring a roofing consultant who tendered bids for us and uh, was able to um, compare apples to apples on, on the different bids. Um, they actually put together a 70 page specification document on what the uh, roofers had to bid on. Uh, it was 
it was it was pretty intense. Um, so once we once we hired these guys, I think it was about five thousand dollars for the whole service. Um, we were extremely happy with them at the end of the day. They also inspected it five times throughout and after to make sure the, the roofers are doing a good job. Um, so highly recommend that. If you're looking for that, I can uh, give you the name of the company that we used. I would recommend them. Um, power versus energy, Warren already went through this. Net metering, same. Um, Warren talked about snow and cold. Um, a study by Nate actually measured the impact of it. Uh, what they would do is for five years, they had a guy go up on the roof every day and clear the snow on, on half the panels. And what they found was approximately 5%. You got, a, you got about a 5% improvement by clearing off the snow every day, um, which is basically nothing for the amount of effort involved. I should uh, just quickly, Justin, give a quick shout out to Tim Matthews, the uh, our um, our uh, lab technician in the Alt Energy program at Nate, who went up and went up and did that every day. It was uh, he's a bit of a hero. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a neat neat project. And I think they've done the same thing in Grand Prairie too, to at, at a different latitude. I've also, um, this is, this study is in the resources that I sent out in the email, just if anyone's curious to look at it. Yeah, the other, the other good thing about that study is it's got five years worth of production data for um, comparing, like as, as a case study for um, how much you should be expecting to generate. Uh, hail, um, these panels are designed to withstand hail. Um, case study I found was there was a crazy storm in Denver and there was lots of damage and out of 3,000 panels they found in the uh, in the storms area they found one panel that had been damaged so it's uh they're 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 built to last for hail um, and the, a lot of these are just the, yeah, going, going through the frequently asked questions that your board is going to have when they're not familiar with the technology. Um, maintenance, basically no maintenance. Uh, the rain and the snow clean the panels for you. Uh, the monitoring is it's all done remotely over the internet. And most of the installers recommend a visual inspection every two years or so to make sure that uh, the, there's, there's visually nothing that's gone awry. Um, when we talked to Foster Park, that's the um, insurance uh, um, brokers or company or whatever they are for all community leagues. They rec they they said our insurance will probably go up by about hundred dollars a year. Um, we haven't we we still need to get around to getting our hall reassessed um, now that the roof and the panels are up. Um, so we don't know if that's if. We can hold them to their word on that, but that's that's what they told us. So, Justin, was that the combined value of the roof and the solar added a hundred? Because that's uh, just the only reason we see a premium increase. It's not because there's a higher risk of the solar; it's because you increase the value of your property. That's right. Yeah, uh, it, it was actually just for the solar. Um, I think when we asked him that question, we didn't ask about the the roof replacement because we didn't didn't know we were getting the metal roof at the time. Oh, I see. Okay. So it might, might go up a little bit more because of the metal roof or who knows, maybe it'll go down. I don't, I don't know what yeah, the... insurance always goes down. That's the way it works. <laughs> That's yeah. Um, I think Warren talked about this already. Um, you're limited by your roof space and also how much electricity you consume in the year. Um, coincidentally, they were the same value for us. So we were able to fill up our whole whole roof and that was exactly the size we needed. Uh, Warren talked about this, east-west facing uh, versus north versus uh, north or versus south, I mean. Um, and uh, we, here's our couple case studies, one from the Nate study. Um, this, this red square here, this is the panel that I looked at from that study as to, uh, what we got, um, or what they got, and this was a uh, an install that our uh, uh, that our installer provided to us as a case study. 
and they were all at uh, the, the same um, same south facing and um, 18 degree roof pitch. So these these numbers made us a bit more confident in the proposals we got. Uh, monitoring, Warren talked about uh, warranty. Warren talked about this is a, this is a big one to make sure your board knows about when you're you're selling it to them. Some of a lot of at least at least ten years. Uh, the inverter, I think we our installer tried to sell us on the ten or twelve year warranty, um, and, and they said we can increase it to ten afterwards. Uh, we just told them to increase it or increase it to 20 afterwards and we just told them to increase it to 20 right off the bat um, just because it's harder to get funding after the after the fact for us uh, so this one talks a little bit about electrical bills uh, these numbers are a little bit they're, they're not exact anymore because it changes month to month but it basically breaks down what uh, what charges are on your bill um, and I, th I think Michael shared the articles I wrote about the reading your electricity bill on his his resources. Um, they actually go into a little bit more more detail about it. Um, this is it was just it, it took me weeks of trying to figure out what these electrical bills look like and and how they work and they're not transparent at all. That it's become a issue that's become near and dear to my heart as to uh, how difficult they are to read. Um, so here's a here's a sample breakdown of one of our bills. Um, our our yearly cost. Um, you got twenty about twenty percent of our bill worked out to be fixed fee. The rest of it was all variable cost based on our usage. Um, so about twenty eight hundred dollars a year we were spending on electricity. Um, with our solar panel installation. Um, most of the uh, most of the variable fees disappear. Um, you're still paying uh, fees on the electricities that you import um, outside of daylight hours, and our estimate was uh, was about a 65% savings on our electricity bill. Um, these are just the numbers that I ran. It might be different for your league depending on. The profile of, of when you use electricity and how much, um, and I'm I'm looking forward to October after our first year when we can um, uh, w when we know for sure how much how much we've uh, saved or or not. And I'm sure I'll be writing a, another series of of blog posts about that. Um, and then and then another series every couple of years or every year or so when you average all the prices out compared to what you used and what the weather did in that year, right? Uh, yes, actually. <laughs> I'll, sh I'll show you my dashboards on that after this. Um, another important thing people want to see is what the financial return on investment is. Uh, I got this from, oh, that's, yeah, that's not the right link, but I think this was PV Watts that I, I got this graph from. So it roughly told us that after 16 years that uh, um, that that we'd be breaking even um, given, given the current pricing. Um, that doesn't account for expected increases in both transmission and distribution and electricity costs over the upcoming years, uh, nor does it account for switching to a, a solar club retailer, which we did last month and are reaping huge benefits from already. Um, but the return on investment, it's not just monetary, it's CO2 emissions. Um, so the calculate rough calculations that I did um, was that it would take about six months like so every it, it, it costs co2 emissions to install the uh, solar panels to manufacture them have them all shipped um, so there, there's there's never a, a non-zero cost to doing anything um, but my, my calculation was that after roughly six months you're looking at um, you, you, you get paid back versus coal so 
hopefully hopefully that makes sense. I don't know if I explained that very well, but that's that's the other way of approaching return on investment. Uh, how do we pay for it? These are just our our things. Uh, most of our money came from our casino funds. We had a pretty big um, pretty big um, nest egg in our casino fund that we were saving up for a park, second phase of our park. So we were able to dip into that a little bit. Um, just showed we had lots of money left over after we spent that. This will of course be different for your leagues. And we were planning to do some uh, outreach and also planning to put up a, a monitor in our hall um, or, or, or at least a poster or something um, to show people the, uh, the production levels. So that's something still to come. And as well as our plans for community engagement, we've, we've already reached out to our uh, elementary school and uh, given them a given their grade five class a tour of our uh, facility and gave them a couple hour session and, and hands on with, uh, with some solar stuff. So that was, that was a pretty fun uh, community engagement opportunity. And that was with our Inglewood school, which is right next door. Um, we had lots of support in our project, our, our NRC, EFCL, and uh, lots of different community leagues. And I hope you'll reach out to me as well with your project um, if you have any, any questions or need advice on anything. Uh, this was our timeline. Um, everything was thrown way off, but yeah, I don't even look at that because that's that's thrown way off. <laughs> uh, and here's a so different different motions that we put on the floor for our board to uh, uh, to approve to be able to proceed with the project. So we split it up into different budgets: the the roofing consultant, the roof itself, and then the solar project. And that just made it easier for us to discuss things in isolation. Um, the 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 guy that didn't believe in solar, he was more than happy to have the roof replaced, but um, wanted to vote against the 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 solar. So we split it all up to make it a, just a easier way to get, get smaller parts passed. And that's the end of that presentation. Um, I'm not going to go through this document, but I'm going to send it to everybody. And it's kind of, it goes through a lot of milestones, um, talks about different, uh, basically everything that I've talked about today. Um, grants, um, what you want to do with the system. Um, so I'll make that available. And I'll make this document available too. This was our document for the, for the city, for our community group led construction project. Um, they wanted to know why we were doing this, how we were paying for it. Uh, staging was actually pretty important for them and, and uh, fencing off. So we made sure that uh, there was a staging area that was fenced off and anywhere near the playground uh, was um, for uh, or like three meters, I think, uh, fenced off just to anything that falls off is away from any of the kids. So I'll share this document. And Warren also mentioned a power meter. Um, I would definitely agree with, with that. Um, this, this is a dashboard that I've put together from our power meter. Yours might not be as uh, in-depth as this, but actually just yesterday, I found that someone left the lights on in the hall, uses two kilowatts of uh, electricity. So that's like just eating into our solar production for, um, we're, we're losing money over the last 24 hours due to those lights being left on. And because nobody's in the hall, um, it's not, wasn't being checked. So um, after this meeting, I'm gonna be emailing somebody and asking them to go, go turn those lights off in the hall. Cause we, what did, what are we, Uh, today I've calculated we lost $4. Um, however, for our last, uh, 
make, making, still making lots of money. Uh, roughly eighty dollars we made in the last uh, um, in the last week alone, and it was a pretty rainy weekend. We'll get you some uh, motion sensors put in after the energy audit, Dustin. No more <laughs> yeah. lights left on. Yeah, that's a good idea. Um, and yes, yeah, so I have I have uh, a weather weather app uh, linked into here as well that tells me the cloud cover at any given point in the day as well as the temperature. So yes, I can uh, calculate the expected uh, efficiency based on cloud cover. We'll, we'll do that at the end of the year. Um, also, also with, so I, I found the lights being left on, but also as soon as we plugged this thing in, we found some rogue appliance that was using that was also using two kilowatts nonstop. And uh, we found that it was a electric heater in a back a, a fire escape hallway um, that was just on almost nonstop all year. Um, so like that's, that's saving us tons of money just having that, um, just having that thing turned off because it didn't, didn't do anything. And we're, because our hall shut down due to COVID, we're basically using no power. We're, we're consuming 180 watts on average throughout the day. So we're just, we're, we're raking in the money. I was gonna say, you definitely wanna go to Silver Club then. Yeah, so that's, we're getting- So, so what's the here, brand? Five, $500 we made in the last month. Yeah. What's the brand of this meter, Justin? Uh, this, well, this uh, this dashboard is something I built myself. Oh, um, okay. It's 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 the meter that comes oh, with uh, Solar Edge, right. but it's got its own. Solar Edge only takes a reading every fifteen minutes or something, right. and puts it up on their uh, um, up on their website. Um, whereas I'm reading this once a second. So, like, if you if we if we zoom in, you can see. Actually, that's not a good one. Yeah, here you Don't can worry. zoom in. You can zoom in, and you can see like how much electricity you're. What's your background in, Justin? Uh, th this is my background. I do. <laughs> I, I I I'm electrical engineer and okay. do data acquisition for mining trucks. Okay. So. It'd be nice if all the monitors came with this, hey, Warren. Yeah, I was I was thinking this is a little on the nerdy side, so that's why I asked. I wasn't sure. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, I'm I'm definitely on the nerdy side. Um, I'm, I'll 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 be honest. This whole project wasn't uh, wasn't for altruistic reasons. It's uh, you don't always, have always something lights. in it for me. You don't have a smart light switches though. You still have to get somebody to go to the hall and shut off the light. That's true. Yep. That's uh well, that's that's one of the next things. Well, I've got I want to get the whole everything revamped all at once. So um, motion sensors and light switches and um, possibly security cameras and smart door locks and link the thermostat in there too and get it all done at once instead of piecemeal. But that then becomes a rather large project that, uh, that, that we don't have money for. Um, I think that covers everything I wanted to. Nope, there's one more thing. Uh, regarding the snow stop, um, this our our snow stop. Um, it did a great job holding the snow in um, and preventing any kids down below from getting injured. But it also did impact our our winter production. Um, so we had a pretty dismal winter. Basically, we generated nothing in February. Um, due to the cover. Um, but like Warren said, that only accounts for about 10% of your year anyways. Um, so even if, even if you're not producing, um, you can make up for it in the summer. Yeah, and, and it, it totally depends on what's below the roof. So in this case, it's a playground. Um, you do have the option of fencing off the playground, but that's probably not an option because it's not your land. And this is the, this is the only negative part of the snow guard is that it works. It holds the snow on the roof, but yeah. it covers the solar panels. 
If you don't have a sidewalk underneath or any kind of publicly accessible area, you can just let it slide off. So it's yeah. self -cleaning. Yeah, if it was on the opposite side of our hall, then it would have been able to just slide off, no problem. But because it was right next to the playground, two stories up, then had had to do it. Yeah, and if, if you guys ever build a community league, you should look at what Inglewoods is, but you should build it the other way around. Because <laughs> the north side of this building is about five times bigger than this. Yes. Well, so it, three, three, three times, and there's not a single vent or, no. or chimney or stack on them. <laughs> clear open face. Of course. But. Yeah, I've, um, that's the one, one thing I tell too, to when I've spoken with oh, uh, at least one league that was looking into building uh, a hall. I got to them a little too late. They'd already gotten pretty far into their design process. I was trying to push them to look at net zero. But, but one thing I said is look, like at least look into solar ready because, which I think they had already done. Um, just because there are so many little tweaks you can make on a design of a building early on that cost nothing that end up making it way more economical and a lot easier down the road if you do decide to go this route. So I think that's, that's everything I wanted to cover. Um, feel free to reach out to me with any questions. I'll provide all the documents and presentations that I've made to Michael for him to share with everybody. Um, I would, and I would just uh, kind of repeat what Justin had said too, is it is, so we've done a lots of community leagues and I've done other stuff other than just solar with community leagues. It is a very lengthy process. So you do, it is helpful if you pick a contractor that has lots of patience. And, uh, and we've made some changes to, with, the way we do business with nonprofits as well as a result of the work we do with community leagues. So we, we assist with um, applications as well as part of the, just built into the cost of the system. And so those are sometimes questions you should ask your uh, contractors as well is sometimes they might be able to assist with stuff like that at no additional cost to you. And if that speeds the project up, it can make a big difference. Um, especially to you. If you're the person who has to do all that and you can find somebody else to do it for you, that's huge, right? So just some stuff to keep in mind, right? It doesn't hurt to ask. That's why I've got Justin making all these documents for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to get him to make uh, dashboards for our energy monitors now. If you really wanna nerd out, I've got tons of sites you can nerd out on. Sounds great. I'd love to nerd out. All right. Well, thanks. Thanks a lot, Justin. I think um, I think uh, we had one question from uh, Cassia from Strathcona. Um, and she asked, did your initial calculations for the savings in electricity cost include what you get back for excess production? Yes. Yeah. So it, uh, it, it the, the two major ways that you are the two really the only two ways you save money are by self consuming what you're producing and therefore avoiding importing electricity and then also exporting uh, uh, back to the grid that your your excess. Um, so yeah, my, my calculations took both of those into account. Um, if your system is sized for 100% of your yearly usage, then over the course of the year, your electricity charges will effectively be zero and your transmission and distribution charges will drop by whatever percent you're self-consuming. Um, so if you, if, if you're, um, if you have a constant electricity usage, doesn't change at all throughout the day, you're looking at roughly 50% um, 50 self-consumed electricity um, because you're, well, sort of, because you're, yep, you have 50% light average over the course of the year on your, on your array. So maybe a bit less, maybe a bit more. It's, that's, that's kind of the average. Um, 
And I think it depends on the hall. So for instance, if you had a daycare yeah. or something like that, that was a daytime activity that was consuming a lot of your electricity, you would get a much higher value than say if you were renting out to weddings and such that were doing it at night. Um, obviously if they're using power at night, you're not generating much. Um, so it, it, it does depend a bit on the, how the hall generates revenue as well, right? Yeah, and I think we're, we're mostly at night. Um, and I think I didn't start collecting most of our data until COVID hit and our hall shut down. So I don't have a lot of data throughout the day. Um, but most, most of the stuff is the furnaces going off and on. And yeah. you can see here a little little inc baseline increase here is like our outdoor lights and our signs that are on for a couple hours at the start and end of the day. So unfortunately you're never gonna self consume anything for your outdoor lights, but that's that's just how it is. Get some LEDs, try, yep. and, try and lower the consumption as much as you can. And, and maybe just a, one detail about this solar club that Justin and I have referred to. It's, it's basically a way of getting around the micro generation regulation. <clears throat> so by law, you have to, you cannot get paid a differential on the electricity. So you can't, for instance, say that solar power is worth more than coal power. Therefore, I should get paid more for it. So you should pay me more for what I export than what I import. That was tried a couple of years ago and it didn't pass the government. That was before the NDP got elected. Um, so what happened a few years ago was you actually have to change contracts. So because this is Alberta, you are an adult, you're allowed to enter into a contract with another party and you can pay whatever you want. It's between you and them. That's the way it's deregulated. So between you and the retailer, you can pay whatever you like for electricity. And so what happens with the solar club is that in the summertime, when you are generating more electricity than you consume, you change your rate pan, plan. So instead of buying electricity at five cents a kilowatt hour, you instead buy it for 22 cents. Now that doesn't make any sense at all. Why would you voluntarily pay four and a half times as much for the electricity? And it's because if you're not heating or something like that with electricity, about March, end of February, beginning of March, you're gonna start generating more electricity and exporting it in a month than you buy. And so maybe in March, you make $50 a month. But I'll tell you what, in April and May and June, July, August, September, October, you're gonna really overgenerate more than you consume. Okay. And so what you do is you, you sign up with a retailer and then you, the one I'm with, you just phone them and say, okay, it's March 1st. I want you to change my rate plan. And then you call them back in the fall and go, okay, October 1st, I want you to change it back. Okay. And so you, you actually have to do that though, because that is actually a requirement of the law is you're, you're actually changing contracts. You stay with the retailer. you this is just a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, everybody knows what's going on. And you, they have two rate plans. One's a regular rate plan and then one's for these crazy solar people. And, um, and so that's really what you're doing. And so this is something that you, you guys, you have to also understand that if somebody looks at the bill and goes, what are you crazy? I, I only pay six cents a kilowatt hour and you're paying 25 cents a kilowatt hour. What are you nuts? And it's because of this the way this works, okay? It's because you're gonna sell more in a month than you buy, okay? And that mm -hmm. difference in price, you're gonna take that extra and apply it to the delivery costs as well. And so that it starts to credit the whole bill, okay? Yeah, so our, here's, here's our last seven days, 400 kilowatt hours exported uh, with Epcor at five cents-ish a kilowatt hour. We would have earned $22 uh, with Ace Energy at 22 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, we we got we earned $88 from exporting so this that. Happens, 
Yeah, and this happens to be the retailer that I also belong to as well. It happens to be a co-op. So you actually become an owner. They have another portion of this. So what they do is they have other customers who do not have solar and they voluntarily pay extra for electricity if they can get it from a green source. And so ACE sources all their electricity from you as a microgen. So they go out and they pay you extra. So they, if this customer is willing to pay two cents a kilowatt extra, ACE gives you 1.85 cents a kilowatt hour. They, they keep a little for administering it and they give you the bulk. So outside of this, Inglewood will get a check four times a year from their other customers who don't have solar, who are trying to incentivize people to do this. So you get this $88 plus every quarter, you get a little bit extra. Actually, we don't qualify for that. We, oh, uh, we gave up our green credits to the MCCAC uh, as yeah. part of the grant. Um, the grant. That's right. Okay. But if you're I, a homeowner. That's, yeah, you if get you're it. a homeowner, it does. It Sorry, makes, I forgot about make, that. That's okay. Um, but we made way more from the grant than we would by the, the quarterly checks. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. That's just a nice to have. So that really only applies to homeowners. But yeah. That uh, comparison looks like your next uh, electricity bill article there, Justin. Yeah, that'll be, uh, that, that'll be part three. <laughs> then I don't have to worry about making anything on that. You can just do all the work for me. And this will change uh, the community league's return on their investment. It'll cut it in half. You'll be close to eight, nine years uh, return on your investment rather than 16. It, it, it makes a substantial difference. Huge. Well, especially because we're you, especially this year because we're not using any electricity due to COVID. <laughs> or we made five hundred dollars in the last month. You should That's just have thing. outdoor outdoor parties after this. So yeah, don't use any power in the hall. Yeah, the the big thing here, as Warren mentioned, is is you have to make sure you call because you don't want to forget. That's and right. Get into the winter and pay through your nose for all your electricity and then you're you're you get kicked off your board or whatever yeah i'm sure i would get kicked off the board for that after after how i sold it to them but it is it is something to keep in mind because you're volunteer boards right and, and you the board changes all the time so you got to make sure that when you're handing over the keys to the next person that they understand what how this works right yeah yeah Um, so there's, there's another couple questions for you here, Justin, if you don't mind, uh, before we get out of here. And then I think, I think after these two, if anyone has any more, maybe just email them to me. Um, and, and I will see if I can get them to the right person and get back to you. Um, so the question is what, what methods, uh, have you used to popularize energy transition in Inglewood after installing your solar array? So that's, that's the phase that we're still working on. Um, the things I've done to date are we had the, we had, we had a tour of the grade five class came to the hall and our, our installer brought a bunch of supplies and we gave them basically a class and a, and a tour on, uh, on solar. Um, I, I, they all really liked it. Um, I've also been trying to share information in our newsletter and, and uh, blog posts. Um, I, I feel like only five or 10 people will ever see those, but that's okay. Um, the big thing that we, we had planned a sustainability and, and solar kickoff event for uh, April uh, and that was canceled. So we'll have to plan some other time to do that. Um, but we we kind of took a break in the winter after the product pro after the system went into production after after a year of work um, we were hoping to start up in the spring again with uh, some community engagement but haven't done much yet unfortunately due to COVID so um, to answer your question not much but we have we have good intentions and and some plans. Thanks, Justin. And um, and then last last question here is, um, what what challenges did you face as a sustainability director at the community level 
um, with respect to um, to energy transition? Uh, the challenges. Um, there was a handful of people on the board that were that were opposed to it, um, so they weren't terribly helpful during the execution stage of it, or 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 trying to get it passed. Um, but I think just working through the project management and dealing with the city was probably the the most difficult part. Um, things things always took a bit longer. The requirements seem to change. Hopefully they've figured out what those requirements are now and uh, and they won't change much further. Um, but who knows, maybe with cutbacks, uh, all that, that uh, ingrained knowledge is, is lost. So uh, I feel like it'll be as bad or worse moving forward trying to deal with the city on, on these types of projects. Um, I wish they could just leave hands off and, and treat it like a roof replacement or something because our, our roof replacement was, was complicated to project manage as well and cost uh, three times as much as, our, as, as the solar, but the city didn't care about it at all. They were just like, roof, okay, whatever, do it. But it was a lot of... Uh, a lot of meetings and, and conversations and documentation to get get to the city on this one. So hopefully with, with what I can share with everybody, then uh, that'll lighten your load a little bit. Well, and maybe with less people and less people to know about all the added regulation, it just won't get brought up as much and people just forget about some of this stuff and it'll slide through because I think I mean, that's my kind of my hope. Like, you're right, it could get worse. But I, I kind of think, you know, who knows, maybe it'll get a little better because there'll be less people paying attention and they'll just be like, it's too much work anyway. And you can just go ahead or something. Yeah, maybe. I know of at least one other community league that didn't even talk to the city and just did the project. Yeah, I'm not supposed to encourage that, though, so. <laughs> you're not. But Justin, is that because they didn't need the financing, the grant? Uh, it actually wasn't related to the, all the work I've done. It wasn't related to the grant at all, actually. Um, the the CLIP grant needed a little bit of documentation. The, uh, the MCCAC grant needed a little bit of documentation, but uh, most of it was for the community-led construction project and, um, and, and, a, and a legal contract we actually had to sign with the city as well. So how did the other community league get around doing that? They just didn't. Did it? <laughs> okay, thank you. It, was, it, it felt like a, it, it felt like we were checking boxes and. Don't ask, don't tell. Yeah, that's. Well, it I know. It didn't, it didn't add any value to our project. I don't know, maybe if you don't, if, if you're a non, if, if you're a league that's not functioning very well and don't have, uh, um, a, a very competent person running it uh, internally, you'll run into problems and that's where the city is concerned and, and wants to step in, but it would, it would, it would be easier if they, if they kept their hands off it for most of the, uh, most of the leagues that are interested in doing it. That's my and thought. Okay. Unfortunately, <laughs> I think it's, sorry, more. I, I was just gonna say, unfortunately, I think it's, it's a case of different departments of the city. While there are some that want to push energy transition, there are others that don't care. Um, and and uh, to Justin's point, like for some reason they treat solar like it's the most risky thing in the world compared to replacing a roof when really that makes absolutely no sense. You're gonna say, Warren? Yeah, well, and as a contractor, uh, we're, we're seeing the same thing with the school boards. So we're working on an outdoor classroom project. Um, the moment same they want to do the same kind of stuff and quite honestly from a contractor's point of view you're just going to add cost to cover that um and th and that's the problem is that um you don't see value from the community league side and it's going to wind up costing you more money uh because the contract the contractors will also get tired of it as well okay so like fencing off these areas and stuff like that I, i'm assuming that the the roofers made a far bigger construction 
mess than the solar guys did. Right? Yep. So it's it's frustrating. It's very frustrating when um, when we see these things, and it and I don't think people appreciate it as much as they probably should. I've had lots of conversations with the city. Um, it's far easier for me to work outside of Edmonton than to work inside of Edmonton. It's very sad. So the city itself is very progressive and they're promoting it on the one hand, but on the other hand, they just make it so difficult to do this. It's yeah. I think that's different departments too. Like I say, I mean, the, the community group led construction folks, that's, I mean, we have an entire energy transition department at the city that's dedicated to getting this stuff going and that's funding green leagues. And that is, that is working with us on this stuff. And then you have roadblocks from other departments of the city. Um, and which, which, it, which would be one thing if it was roadblocks that were applied even handedly for all construction projects. But when it seems like, to me that there, there's just an ax to grind against solar or just all this unnecessary concern that doesn't actually make any sense. That's, that's when I find it extremely frustrating. Yeah. Like to re-roof, you don't need a permit. There's no permit required for re-roofing. Um, it, we, when we go to do it, we need a permit and we need, uh, and if I do commercial projects now, I also, I have to have a structural engineer stamp a drawing and I have to have an electrical engineer stamp my stuff as well. And, um, and so if I was doing a homeowner's place or commercial, they give a rebate, but quite honestly, I will spend more money than the rebates worth. So the homeowner gets the rebate, the contractor gets all the costs. And at some point that's just gonna make uh, things more and more expensive at some point. It, so I think as a group, we're all trying to convince the city to get some common sense involved. So uh, what I would recommend is uh, community leagues do is to complain about it, if you can, because I don't think anybody's happy about it. And it honestly doesn't really add a lot of value to things. And, it's, and like Mike said, if they, and Justin said, if they did it for the roofers and for everybody else, okay, then all right, everybody has to do it, but it's not, it's just the solar guys. Well, it's something that's been on my list to, to try and get the EFCL involved with advocating for. Um, but unfortunately there have been other things that have gotten in the way, um, you know, government shift, COVID, things like that. And then, you know, CFAP getting cut, all these other things where we need to, as an organization, tread carefully and, and approach what's, what's the most valuable overall. And so, well, to me, solar is the most important thing that we could be working on. Uh, that's not always going to be the case for the organization. So I hope to, to try and make some headway with the city on this stuff, but certainly community leagues, if, if, you, if any of you folks feel like you, you have issue with this, I would encourage you to mention it to your NRCs and try and, you know, notes to councillors never heard either. But. I was hoping to write a letter to our councillor and was working on drafting it and then COVID came up and felt like it would fall on deaf ears due to all their other priorities. So I've delayed that a little bit. Probably smart strategically. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks so much, Justin, and to you as well, Warren. We're, we're well past time. Um, so I think, I think what I'll do is I'll just tell people to, um, to go take a look at some of the resources I sent out in the, in the email, if, if you didn't get that, please let me know. Um, and, uh, and I'll get that information out to you. Um, so there's some other resources there you can look at. There's our preferred contractors list. There's some of the articles Justin wrote, the Nate study on snow. Um, and some, I think, uh, and uh, funding, uh, a document for, for funding various different types of pro renewables projects and stuff. So, so please look at that. Um, and feel free to contact me with with any questions or if you decide you want to go ahead with any of this stuff and I can I'm, I'm here to help with all this this as well um, and then yeah Justin I think mentioned he would he would send me his stuff to share with you so I will get that out to you guys as well uh, once I received that from him and um, and Warren is would, would you mind sharing your slides as well is that yep no for sure Okay, great. Um, so I'll, I'll get all that out to everyone. And, um, 
and also this this whole uh, this workshop was going to be posted. The recording will be posted on our website. Um, we're kind of in the process of rebuilding right now, so there may be a bit of a delay. Um, I may post it all to the old website in the meantime, though, uh, just just to get it up for people. Um, and then with that, there's also going to be the other videos from the other two workshop sessions we did last month. Um, and I also will probably share, I think what I'll do is just send an email out to every participant of all three workshops, sharing all of the documentation and just resources all in one, in one email if I can, just so people can look through and see if anything's useful. Um, the one other thing I would ask or, or mention is that I did post on the email I sent out a, um, just a quick survey um, on the workshop. It literally has seven questions that will take like two minutes to fill in talks. Um, so I think what I'll do is if anyone was here for all three workshops and fills out all three, I will give you a $20 gift card to Tim Hortons. <laughs> and anyone who just attended this workshop who fills out this one, I will enter into a draw for, for a few of them and the top three people will get them literally minute and a half, two minutes to fill them out. So I, I really just appreciate if people would, would try and do that because it, um, it helps me out for the future workshops and knowing kind of what, what works and what doesn't work. Um, and also the city of Edmonton for my grant money asked me how I assess these things. So it's nice to have something to tell them. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, it's getting late and, and I know maybe people have other things that they want to do or, or they want to get to bed and celebrate tomorrow or whatever. So one, I just one more big thank you to uh, to Warren and Justin. I, I appreciate you guys coming out. I think that was really, really great. Um, and yeah, I even I learned quite a bit that I think is going to be really helpful for me. So thanks again. Oh, you're welcome. All right. Um, yeah, if that's, is, is there any more quick, quick questions or wrap up anyone wants to address before we head out or, or can we call it at that? Nothing? No? Wait, there's something in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Cool. Thanks guys. Um, take care everyone. Thanks everybody. Have, Have a good night. Good